Hi friends! I hear that you want to learn how to do the quantitative analysis FRQ and guess what? I'm here to help you with that. I'm super excited to go through this four-point FRQ that you will see on the AP Government and Politics exam. You've got 20 minutes to be able to accomplish this task successfully. We're not even going to need 20 minutes to talk about it, so let's just jump in. Our first stop here is we want to look at how this is structured. And so you'll notice here in this graphic organizer that you see those four tasks are going to bring up our favorite four, our, our favorite task verb. So we already know what identify, describe, and explain means. And so you're just going to follow the lead of the prompt and do whatever that task verb determines that you do. Again, identify means to name, describe means to break down into its component parts, and explain means to show how relationships or why relationships exist between concepts. So again, then we got our four points. Let's get a little bit closer to those four points and see what you're going to be asked to do. In our A point, our first thing that we're going to be doing here is we're going to be answering that question. That is super important and I cannot emphasize it enough. Oftentimes, not answering that question by repeating it as a statement and then providing an answer. Um, I see too many times that, that responses go off into an, a, different, um, a different question, one that's not on the task at hand, and that usually results in uh, no points. So we want to make sure that we're looking at our data. What's being being presented, what does that chart, table, or graph show you? And then you need to tell me what it shows you. So that oftentimes means identifying and describing particular points or how things are structured. We always want to make sure that we're using precise numerical values when we can. Our B point is a little bit more complicated, but it's not the end of the world. So what we're here to do is look for patterns or trends or similarities or differences. And we can look at them in two different ways. Over time, that's called a time series, or across different data groups. We call that cross-sectional. Oftentimes we're looking for something known as correlation, which is a statistical concept. We don't need to know the statistics to be able to see whether or not there is a positive change in one variable causing a positive change in the other variable. We call that positive correlation. If they are moving in opposite directions, so one is increasing and the other one is decreasing, we call that negative correlation. We also might want to think about whether or not we see a, signif a, a significant match match in that pattern between variables, that's going to tell us that there is a strong correlation without us getting into the weeds on the statistical um, relationships. And then weak correlations are going to be weaker patterns where it's much more difficult for you to see. Now, the good news is, is that questions that are asked of you, there will be a pattern, there will be a trend, there will be a correlation, and you just need to talk about what's there. My recommendation is to always go for the obvious ones. They are um, usually there, it's, it's usually the answer we're looking for, so don't get fixated on outliers or small breaks and trends or patterns, and use those numerical values as examples, not basic adjectives like more or less. And of course, always make sure you're answering that question clearly. Let's zoom in a little bit closer and see what an example of patterns or trends are. Trends are generalized directions of change within a data set. So here you see a positive trend in blue and a negative trend in orange, right? Orange is it's, it's something is increasing, some, one of the other variables is decreasing, whereas with positive, you see both of them are increasing over the same kind of period. And then our pattern here is in green, where it is a generalized repeating sequence across the data set. Now, of course, this is like a picture perfect version. Let's take a look at what it might look like in a real world sample. So here, what we have is a figure of voting rates by race and Hispanic origin that's telling us that this is coming from the census because they do break down their data tables by race and by um, ethnic origin, Hispanic origin, they are different. So here, one of the recommendations that I give to my students is we want to eyeball trends. And so we don't have time to figure out the best, the line of best fit. That's a 
concept going back to statistics, but you can find a line that fits pretty well just by using this simple trick. And that is when you're drawing a line to see if there's positive or negative relationships, I might want to put as many of the factors or as many of the variable data points above my line as below my line. And when I'm doing that, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm connecting the first and last variable. I need to make sure that they are just as many above as below. And you really see that illustrated really well here in the black non-Hispanic variable, where particularly at the end, you see the blue line ends well above the final data point. Once I have that line of good fit, I can start to talk about trends and patterns that might be on the page. All right, so now we're gonna to get to drawing a conclusion. And here, this final point is getting at the larger meaning of the data. We wanna think about why that data is displayed the way it is for our C point. We wanna think about what the author is trying to show us, what evidence and reasoning do we have to support our conclusion. So when we're drawing a conclusion, we're kind of coming back around and saying, well, this is what I think this means. You always need numerical data to help support your assertion, whatever that conclusion might be. So make sure that you're continuing to provide numerical data and you're still repeating that prompt as a statement and taking a position. On to our D point here, we are looking at the relation to content. Of course, we need to be able to draw this back into what we know from the course. So we want to take that data and have it inform an answer that's external to the question. Here we're providing evidence from data married with your knowledge of the course content and showing how those two are related to illustrate a connection. You do want to provide commentary that elaborates on this relation that shows how or why you got there. And again, always answer the question, be logical, repeat that prompt, all of the things that we've talked about. This is the part that really feels like your uh, results section and maybe a scientific report that you're doing because we are talking about variables, right? How does one variable impact the other, the independent impact the dependent, just like you would in a science experiment. We don't need to use that terminology, stick to the course concepts, um, but it's, it's an analogy that I like to use that students are often comfortable with. All right, so now that we have done that, it's important for us to take a look at what an actual prompt might look like and to break that down. So let's dive a little bit deeper. Here you see the basic structure. You'll be given a data set. And once you're given that data set, you'll also notice that there is a series of four questions. I included the scoring guidelines just so we're on the same page. We should get a little bit closer to figure out what this is going to take a look like. So, of course, the rubric, we always come back to that, making sure that we're, sticking, we're getting points for describing the data, describing patterns, drawing a conclusion, and explaining our connection. Those are all very important components. And once we have kept that in mind, then we're going to go back and take a look at general trends and patterns, looking for particular points that need closer examination as indicated by that prompt. What is a logical case or cause for those trends? Do I need to tell how or why they are different explanations, why gets to process, I'm sorry, how gets to process, why gets to causation. Um, and then of course, if there's simple calculations to be done, then you should do them and make sure you outline your answer. All right, let's take a look at this very same prompt and break it down into some answers. So I've broken down my data here. I've got two different things happening at the same time. The first thing that I noticed is that in red, I've pointed out that this data set is not in chronological order. So I took the liberty of going through and ordering them. I had the information there because it gave the dates of the terms in parentheses. So I just put them in order. And what I did notice is that on the bottom is where I see mostly candidates from further back in time and at the top are the more recent candidates. Now I can still see that there's kind of a pattern in this behavior and so that's important. I'm going to tuck that away. The other thing that I noticed in yellow here is a pretty simple pattern of behavior that as we have increasing number of vetoes, 
we have increasing number of veto overrides. So I think that this data has been organized from the least amount of vetoes to the most amount of vetoes. An interesting thing here is that in the past I've had students say, well, it's also in alphabetical order. But I don't think that that would be something that I could logically talk about because it doesn't seem to be what the person who constructed this data set wants me to key in on. So that would be something that, while it might be true, isn't really helpful for me answering the question. All right, so on to our A point. Again, we're looking to describe how the relationship between vetoes and veto overrides have trended over time. So here, I'm going to make sure I label my points, my parts, and I'm going to repeat that prompt. The graph shows that, the, that generally more recently, more. <laughs> Generally, more recent presidents issue less vetoes and therefore are less, there are less veto overrides. Barack Obama has the least vetoes and nearly the least veto overrides of all 10 listed presidents with approximately 10 vetoes and one veto override in his eight year term. Ronald Reagan has the most with the approximately 77 vetoes. So again, I'm just kind of describing my data set there exactly as I see it. When we get to the B point, here we are looking for a description of trends, patterns, similarities, and differences. And so I'm looking for a similarity in the relationship between vetoes and veto overrides. Now, even if I've already alluded to that, I wanna make sure that I'm stating it again. There is nothing wrong with being thorough. So my answer here, one similarity in trends found in the graph is that as the number of vetoes increases, so do the number of veto overrides. Again, the simplest explanation is probably the best. For example, George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush both have the third and fourth lowest veto rates at 21 and 30, respectively. They each had zero vetoes. However, Clinton and Obama each have less, but not a significantly higher amount of veto overrides. Both Reagan and Nixon have high levels of vetoes at approximately 66 and 77, respectively. Nixon and Reagan both have higher numbers of veto overrides at 12 and 9 respectively. So there's some oscillation in my pattern and I'm making sure that I'm pointing that out, but why I'm also sh making sure that I'm explaining why I'm drawing the, uh, I'm seeing the pattern that I see, which is going to set me up for the next part because I have to use the B point, this stuff, to take me into the C point. So let's see what the conclusion is that I draw. One reason for the similarity in these trends could be that the more vetoes a president signs, the more likely Congress is to find numbers to override the presidential veto. Congress cannot perform a veto override if there was no presidential veto preceding it. Therefore, the numbers are reliant upon presidential action. That's a perfect, that's, that is a, the logical conclusion that I can draw from the data set that's given to me. I don't have to use any outside information to get there, which is really important that your conclusion don't require something else to support them. So oftentimes it's going to be a very logical and it's going to feel like it's kind of basic, but that's okay because that means that you're using the data that's presented in front of you to make that assertion. Finally, we get to our D point where we are explaining the use of vetoes and veto overrides to reinforce Madison's argument about checks and balances in 51. So here we're connecting back to course concept, making sure that I'm using all of the terminology and vocabulary that is in that prompt. Vetoes and veto overrides are critical to checks and balances because it's another way to prevent the legislature from being tyrannical. That's my position. In Federalist 51, Madison said the legislature necessarily predominates in power and can be therefore more abusive of our liberties than the other branches. For that reason, the framers created a check against the tyrannical exercise of power. So here I've set up all this information about 51, and now I need to marry it up to my data set. The veto is very hard to override, requiring a two-thirds vote in the House and the Senate. There I'm really making sure that I show my understanding of that process. Finding 66 senators and 288 congressmen to vote on a bill is difficult but not impossible. The higher vote Voting requirement acts as an insurance policy against the passage of a law that harms a minority as it requires more support. So that is our answer. I do have student rubrics that are available for you that are found on the website below in case you want to go back and have something to help you make sure that you're checking off all the boxes. But other than that, that's it, my friends. I mean, we have accomplished in about 15 minutes the quantitative analysis FRQ. Good luck. Go get them, kid.